Grace, mercy, and peace be yours in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our text is from John 8. I read again verses 31 and 32. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Here is the reading of our text. May God add his blessings to the reading of his word. Amen. Happy Reformation Sunday. Okay. I know that Reformation Day is really October 31st, and yes, it would be more appropriate to have our special Reformation service on that day. But I also that many, maybe most, maybe all of us, will be doing something related to that other celebration <laughs> that happens on October 31st, which is so popular in America, at least ways that has gained that popularity over the last century. So we're going to celebrate Reformation today, the last Sunday of October, like the overwhelming majority of our sister congregations. This is, of course, a Sunday when pastors across our nation can impress their congregations with how much they know in Reformation history. Or we could think about the historic uses of the assigned lessons. For example, that one out of Romans. That has probably been preached so many times that the only one who knows the count is God himself. But, you know, it just puts forward the theme of justification by grace alone through faith alone so well that every Lutheran pastor is drawn to it. Or I might use our psalm for today, which is the one that inspired Martin Luther to write, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. What a great psalm. Or, and I've done this sermon, you know, that angel in the book of Revelation. And we could talk about how that vision became partially true uh, in the Reformation with all of those people who were proclaiming the everlasting gospel around the world. People like, of course, Martin Luther. Or pastors might talk about the impact that the Reformation has had on a popular culture, like the rise of literacy. Show of hands, how many people here can read? You can thank the Reformation. Okay. Or, you know, I could talk about how the Reformation rehabilitated the daily life of the average man, making all people priests and all work godly and part of God's daily way of taking care of us. Or I could talk about how the Reformation and the discovery of new lands prompted a brand new age of missions. And I could easily go on and on. But today, instead of any of those messages, we are going to consider Jesus' words about abiding in our gospel lesson, which perhaps is not quite as obviously Reformation-oriented. Now, just a quick uh, bit of context around our reading, which comes out of John 8. Uh, in that chapter, opposition to Jesus by the Pharisees is taking an uptick. They are trying to trap Jesus and what he says. In verses 12 through 20, Jesus says that he is the light of the world, and anyone who follows him will have the light of the world, the light of life. The Pharisees attack and twist Jesus' words, and Jesus parries what they say. In verse 21 through 30, Jesus says that the only way to be saved is through faith in him, and he predicts his own death. But again, the Pharisees fail to understand. However, many in the crowd do believe in Jesus, sort of a incipient baby faith, if you will. Some of these will be, of course, those who welcome Jesus on Palm Sunday and also line the road weeping and wailing as Jesus bears his cross to his death. In our text, Jesus turns specifically to these 
because it says the Jews who had believed in him. Now that's an interesting phrase in John because the word Jews is used in a very special way in John's gospel. After all, technically, everybody there, even Jesus, was a Jew, right? But he singles these out uh, to be different from the other Jews. You see, John tends to use the word Jew to refer to unbelieving Jews. So John distinguishes these Jews from your run-of-the-mill unbelieving Jew by saying that they believe in him. However, as we read this text, uh, we see that their faith wasn't really very strong, was it? It had been weakened or was being weakened by human reason. And I suppose that is why Jesus still calls them Jews instead of believers. Jesus says that if they abide in his word, he will set them free. Now this is first and foremost an offer of grace, an offer of forgiveness. He was set free from sin, right? Okay. We are all born as slaves to sin, as Jesus said. Our every inclination is away from God and the life God has for us. The borderline Jews focus on the offer of grace that Jesus gives, but they reject it. They feel they don't need grace. They don't need forgiveness. They don't need freedom. Do you, you've never been a slave to anybody. You know, I don't need to be free. There is nothing unusual about this rejection. People continue to reject grace reject forgiveness to this very day. It may be surprising to you, but many object to the confession of sins and absolution that we have in our typical Sunday morning worship service. Some feel they have not sinned, and therefore they don't need forgiveness, and they should not confess that they are sinners. Some are troubled that Christ has commissioned mere humans to offer his forgiveness. They might say something like, well, I'm just as good a Christian as that preacher up there. Why does he presume to forgive my sins? Who is he? Whatever rationale the fallen human person may come up with, forgiveness is still being rejected. They, like the borderline Jews in our reading, are tripped up by reason or pride or whatever. Now this is a Reformation Sunday sermon, or so I should keep this Reformation theme going. And so I want to point out that receiving forgiveness is what drove the Reformation. To be precise, receiving forgiveness by grace through faith in Jesus. In our text, being set free from the bondage to sin is the same thing as being justified by grace through faith. It's a different metaphor to be sure, and therefore it brings forward a different dimension of God's mercy, but it is the same precious gift. Now Jesus said that if you abide in his word, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. To Pilate, Jesus said, for this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. John, near the end of his gospel, wrote, He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth that you may believe. Truth is a special word in John's gospel. Did you know that truth appears only one time in Matthew, one time in Mark, and one time in Luke? 21 times in John's gospel. John has an interest in truth, doesn't he? Time and time again, we find in John's gospel that truth is completely tied to Jesus and his word. But perhaps the most important text for understanding truth in John's, in John's gospel is when Jesus said, I am the way and the truth. 
and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. Who is truth there? Who is way there? It's not some abstract concept, is it? To know the truth is to believe in Jesus. Therefore, to abide in the word of Jesus is to abide in Jesus. You cannot have Jesus apart from his word, and you cannot truly have the word apart from Jesus. It is, it is through the power of his word that the Holy Springs Spirit brings us to Jesus. This is so if you are one month old or 100 years old. For the infant child, the word works through the means of the water in baptism to create faith. But it is still the word doing the work. It's not the water and it's not the pastor. It's the word that's doing the work that's in, the, in that water. If the person is 100 years old, the word works either through a conversation, like maybe you're talking to them, or a sermon, you brought them to church, or a song, they paid attention to what the choir is saying today, or something like that. Again, also, of course, it could be baptism, even if you're 100 years old. In both cases, though, it is the word, uh, the work of God that is getting done, not a work of man. Also, in both cases, whether you're one month or 100 years old, the grace can be rejected, just as the borderline Jews in our text today seem to be leaning in that way. Jesus makes this same offer of forgiveness when he established the Lord's Supper. He said quite pr plainly that this sacred meal was given us for the forgiveness of sin. So we have the word of Christ offering forgiveness and communion. But we know that that word is not devoid of the presence of Christ, you know, because the word and Christ's presence are connected. So we have the word of Christ offering us forgiveness and communion, but we also have this word of forgiveness in the supper we see is not given apart from Jesus. Jesus said that we receive his body and blood in the sacrament. Paul tells us that the bread and the wine and commun communion is actually a communion with or a participation in the body and blood of Jesus. So again, we find our freedom from sin tied up with Christ and his word. And you really can't drive a wedge between Christ and his word. As I said, you can't have one without the other. Now, some, tripping over human reason again, wonder why Jesus gives us more than his word. After all, they argue, if everything is dependent on the word, why do we need baptism in the Lord's Supper? Aren't they extras, superfluous, whatever? What a poor line of reasoning this is to reject God's goodness and mercy. It is like saying, my parents left me $100,000 in their will. And I have no idea why they did that, because I could have gotten along just fine with $10,000. Why did they bother with the extra $90,000 that I didn't need? Just as we would not question the generosity of our parents in their last and will and testament, so we should not question the generosity of God in his New Testament. One more idea before we tie all these things together. In John 6, we have our Lord's famous bread of life discourse. He said, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. In John 15, Jesus uses an illustration of a vine and branches. And he said, already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. 
If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. In these passages, we are encouraged to abide in Jesus. As Jesus tells us to abide in his word in our reading from John 8. Once again, we see that you cannot have one without the other. So in verse 7 of John 15, Jesus equated abiding in him with abiding in his word. We also have Christ abiding with us, with his body and blood, in our Lord's bread of life sermon. Now let us tie all this up. To abide in Jesus is first and foremost a gift, not something we do. It is a gift that he gives through his word. This word is transmitted in written or spoken form or through elements of baptism and the Lord's Supper. I might also add that it can be communicated through the visual arts like painting and sculpture and so forth, but perhaps not as clearly as spoken and so maybe easier to misunderstand. Now let me say this slightly differently. Abiding in Jesus is not your work. If you walk out of here today thinking that abiding in Jesus and his word is something that you must achieve, you have misunderstood my message. If you walk out rejoicing that Christ in abides in you by virtue of his word and sacrament through no merit or worthiness on your part. It is a gift of pure grace, pure mercy, pure love. Then you understand what the Lord wants you to do. Don't go out of here worrying, have I done enough to make Jesus abide in me? He abides in you through word and sacrament. As always, it is God who acts. We receive. Through his word and sacrament, Christ abides in you and he has set you free. Amen. May the peace of God who passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.